everybody, welcome to the latest episode of The Rock Experience with Mike Brunt. On this episode, I'm excited to have joining me Robert Ortiz, drummer from Escape the Fate. We're going to talk all about the band's forthcoming new album, their touring plans for the rest of this year, and so much more. What a great conversation it was with Robert. I think you guys are going to really, really enjoy this one. So let's jump in and let's get started. You know, I want to first welcome you to the show. Thank you for joining me today. And I just want to start off by congratulating you, the forthcoming release of your newest album coming out on September 1st. So you've been in the industry for, what, almost 20 years now. Do you still get excited at the time of a new album? Are you relieved? Like, oh, good, that's done. What do you still get nervous? Like, are the fans going to like this? Are they going to dig this? <laughs> Listen, man, it's funny you say that. Excited is not the way I describe it. I am, aside from maybe my dad, who's my biggest fan. He's also my biggest critic. And mm. I'm aside from him, I'm my biggest critic and uh, nothing the band ever does is good enough. I fucking hate all of it. And I'm always <laughs> mad. And so like, I take a step back because you're up close to it. You know what I mean? So you could like, if you look at a painting and you're like right up on it, you could see all the smudges and you can <laughs> see all the imperfections and then you back up and you're like, Oh, actually that's really beautiful. And that's how I think what happens with our music. I think I'm too close to it. And it's, it's never exactly what I envision it. It's, mm. It becomes its own thing, right? So it's never what the other guys want. It's never exactly what I want. But somehow what we put together becomes its own thing. So I do get nervous. And I am always wonder, like, excitement's not the right word. It's more nervous. It's more like, okay, it's out of our system. It's going to be out into the world. I just hope people like it, you know? And, yeah, and and in music, it's so fickle and it goes up and down. I don't know how I'm able to be a professional almost 20 years now and be one of those bands. It's kind of like a whole it's weird. A whole new, new generation <laughs> yeah. of fans is like into it. It's they see us in a different way. And we're like that cool underground band that, <laughs> you know, they, they want to show off to, to that. Yeah, I listen to them. And then in turn, that makes the older fans that have been around, it becomes this thing. So we're actually not quite so underground and, <laughs> you know, and I, I hope they like it and I hope something resonates and you, you hope people get the thing, you know, I was talking before you with someone else about one of the songs and how, when I write like anything lyrically, there is, it, I can never just write just like, oh, let me give it a catchy tune. Give me a catchy line or something. It's always like something that almost like a diary thinking <laughs> sure. about my life and how do I make it into something artistic and manipulate that in that way. So it's always comes from this weird, vulnerable place in, in whatever's happening in my life. So I hope people connect to it and get what we're trying to do. And yeah, you get really nervous for it, man. You do. Yeah, well, I think that's probably part of the reason why you've been so successful for two decades is because you care clearly a lot. Now, let me ask you this. Have you read any of the feedback? Because you've released a few singles from the album. And at least from what I've seen online, the feedback has been tremendous, right? A lot of fans are saying, man, it sounds like you've returned to your classic sounds, back to your roots. Number one, do you agree with that? And number two, do you actually read any of that feedback online? Okay. Personally, I don't go online. Okay. Uh, like if I'm on the internet at all, I'm watching YouTube videos of how to do bodybuilder things or 49ers, <laughs> 49ers things. I, I don't like to read it because it makes no difference. Like I said, I'm my harshest critic and you just hope people like it. You're curious, sure. you know, but I, I can't allow myself to go into it. 
it's just once it's out of me, it's out. And, and that's that. And, you know, the other guys care a little more about that sort of thing. <laughs> and they want, they want to know they're going to read it. And, but it's always like, like someone told me about this thing, uh, like some joke meme from recently where it's like, uh, band rearranges entire tour to play some city because of one comment saying, why aren't you playing my town? Oh and my God. <laughs> you know what I mean? And so that's how I think about comments. It's like, one person likes it or doesn't like it it's like i don't know how much to take that to heart but um again i'll go back to my dad being such a harsh critic our last video that we did he's like showing his friends he's like it's badass i like it it's kind of <laughs> weird but i like it and that other singer in it is really good too and I'm like okay if you like it there's something there you know uh, was your dad supportive of you you know you pursuing music as a kid oh yeah absolutely so you know, he wasn't perfect, but yeah, he, he was, the, he was the dad that was like, if I played baseball, he was the coach. And mm -hmm. when I got into music, like he, I played drums in the garage and he would like, like soundproof it and insulate it and everything. Mm -hmm. And everyone was at my house every day after school, we would practice. And I remember watching him. He always had a beer, right? And just a tall can <laughs> of beer and he'd just be sitting there drinking for like years. He's just like this going, that song sucks. <laughs> That song sucks. And then once this band's formation, like the original full complete lineup, and we started going, it, it started to turn into like, that's good. That's good. I'm like, okay, we're on to something, you know? But, uh, but I am, I am, I guess I am excited. I hope people uh, will enjoy it and sing it. And yeah, we just got to deliver. Absolutely. Now you mentioned the song, you know, Cheers for Goodbye, obviously the video that your dad was showing people. So how did you get about collaborating with Spencer from Ice Nine Kills? You know, talk about how that collaboration came to be. Look, I'm going to tell you the, the part of collaborating that I don't like. So oftentimes labels and industry people like to be like, <laughs> you need a collaboration. Anyone you guys want to collaborate with, you know, because just it, numbers wise, it makes sense. You bring sure. in their fans and then they'll listen and maybe they become your fans. Right. Yep. So that doesn't work for me because I'm an artist. Like, I don't give a shit how famous you are. Like, if, if it works for us, cool. And we create something that we both like, great. If we don't, then I'm not going to force it, right? Sure. And so I don't go in thinking, let's try to get somebody. Everything has been organic. On the last album, I had a vision to have Lindsey Sterling on a song and it came to be, you know? And um, with this one, we were working on that song, Cheers to Goodbye. And it became evident that it was becoming this sort of circusy theatrical thing. And we always liked the Ice Nine Kills guys and what, especially what they've become more recently. And we're like, oh, dude, like we started doing these character type <laughs> weird things like circus parody stuff. And we're like, dude, the guy from Ice Nine Kills will probably sound fucking sick on this. Let's hit him up, you know? And it was that simple. And he was nice. like, yeah, sure. And then you just try to figure out when. And he was down. And of course, well, you're here. You want to record some more shit? Because in our heads, we're thinking literally like a 10, 20 second piece. Mm. And, you know, it's like, well, sing the other parts too. You're here. Maybe it'll sound good. And it did. So it's like, well, fuck yeah. It's just very but organic. It's just something you envision and you go for it. And it worked out. And then he uh, did the video with you guys as well. Yeah. You know, and it's, it's not, look, it, there is a reality to logistics and time and money and shit like that. And he was kind enough and he, he took it seriously and he took some time and look, he's, he's been killing it. They've been on tour with fucking Metallica. They've been on tour doing their own shit, falling reverse, all this stuff. So they're, they're doing a lot of big things. And he took the time to on his day off, go and record uh, some scenes that we could, work in the video and everything and he had an outfit that was kind of matching what we were doing and <laughs> he took it seriously and and yeah so luckily we we're able to get him of course the footage got there like the day before we needed to release the video <laughs> okay. but that's how it goes that's how it goes right and it works and it looks great i i think so absolutely now you mentioned the songwriting before right and writing lyrics so what was the songwriting like for this album do you each come in with like different ideas you just sit in a room and jam until something sounds good how does the songwriting work oh fuck <laughs> 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 it's all over the place man um, i'll be honest with you um you know i just i just told the story of how one song it was like a a piece that I was working on on my phone while I was, uh, you know, at a sonogram for my daughters. <laughs> Which you know? song was that? 
Uh, it's the first one. It's called Forgive Me. Yeah. And it has this piano thing. And I had this whole orchestral idea. And it never kind of came to fruition. It just sort of sat on hard drives as a demo. And then years later, you know, I go through some life changes and, and you know, I, I reinvent myself and my friend goes through a very depression thing where he tried to kill himself. And that mm. sort of line came to me, like, it's like a rebirth and like the death to yourself and all that stuff. And I thought, wow, my friend literally tried to kill himself yesterday. Like he, he like did, he was dead for a minute and me spiritually, I killed myself and that's that that like to say that you died on a certain day, like was it stuck with me. So I had that line. I killed myself today. Like that mm-hmm. line just stuck around for years. And then I and I gave that to Craig and then Craig went with it. You give it to the rest of the band. And then all of a sudden, Eric's got this fucking riff just going. <laughs> and then it's like, oh, shit, that's fucking cool. Yeah. And then it's like, hey, well, I got the bridge from the original version with all this other shitty stuff that didn't work. <laughs> right. But the bridge part was cool. And then we bring that back. And so it's all these pieces. And sometimes it's like that. And Craig had uh, the Cheers to Goodbye song. He had like this pop ballad chorus that he didn't even want to release for his like really heavy side project. Right. It's just sort of a thing, a ballad he wrote for like his girlfriend, who's his wife now. And he played it and it's just like, dude that's sick and then (laughs) eric tries to do some shit to it it's like yeah that's not working bro let's let's just scrap all that but let's keep that then we sit down you just pick up a guitar and you get going and other times it's like a song that didn't sound good 10 years ago sounds good now and there's times where we went in with john feldman and we just experimented and we'd invite other people to write with us who've written with bands that we really like and you know, other band members, if you know, that, that have written and we try stuff. We're very experimental in a lot of ways. That's why our sound, you know, you mentioned earlier about people saying, oh, you've gone back to your original sound. Do I agree with that? No, because I don't think we have a sound, <laughs> yeah. but we do. It's weird. Like hmm. ACDC has a fucking has sound. A sound. Yes. <laughs> That's ACDC. Yes, but us, we don't like have a particular thing other than maybe Craig's voice and it manipulates, it moves around. And for whatever reason, it ultimately ends up sounding like it goes together. But yeah, every song kind of takes its own role and it just, they all start in different ways. Sometimes you're sitting in a room. Sometimes you're by yourself. Sometimes it's a riff. Sometimes it's a lyric, a line. Mm -hmm. Other times it's a melody. Sometimes it's three people. Sometimes it's six people. Everything changes. And then you get in the studio, you start recording and then it just, everything goes out the window when you start going in this new direction. So there is no formula. We don't have, all right, this guy writes the guitar parts. This guy does the, all the vocals. And then the rest of us try to, you know, do the the stuff for it. That's everything's chaotic. And as a result, we fight a lot, but (laughs) that's what I was going to ask you. Yeah, (laughs) absolutely. Holy shit. I'm the worst. (laughs) Are you really? Why? (laughs) Why? What way? Because, you know, the problem with me is I get an idea in my head. I want to go this direction. I want it to sound this way, but I can't get it out of me. That's you know, it. I can't shred on guitar and I can't sing. I can maybe give you a little bit of a melody. So okay. it's like, do this thing that's in my head, but I don't know how to tell you how to do it. And if you do it <laughs> wrong, I'm going to be mad at you. That's what happens. Okay. But it's like, eventually we at least get close. <laughs> and, and then I, when it's their ideas, there's less fighting. Cause I'm like, okay, that works. And I'm gonna do my best on drums for your idea, yeah. you know? So it's, it, it goes all over the place. And it, it was really a, a hard process. Honestly, it was very challenging. Ask Jamie. It took us like a million years to make this record. Oh, well. this record <laughs> took the longest out of any other in our career, partially because of pandemic, partially because just, we still have to tour and do all those things. And sure. we just, we took our time, you know? So I was going to ask you if it gets any easier, right? And like, obviously, Craig's been in the band now. There's the seventh album with you. But it sounds like, no, it doesn't get any easier. But is it fun going through that process for you? In the big picture, it's a lot of fun. Uh, I like those fights. I like Mm -hmm. those fights more than the, you know, the other things, which, you know, because we have growing pains as, as, you know, we're adults and now we have responsibilities. And those things become challenging. And it's hard because it becomes very personal, like, you know, Craig and I both have kids. And when we're talking about booking shows and touring schedule, and you have to say, it's my kids, 
And then huh. he says, well, you know, I have kids too, but I'm down to do it. And then it's like, okay, how do we <laughs> challenge each other on who's parenting style right <laughs> is worthy of affecting the band and all that and it's those are that's because you can't win you can't and so but when it comes to artistic stuff it's aggravating and annoying but it, it's fun because then you sit back and you're like that wasn't how it was in my head but that is pretty cool that's right. unique right that's you know? awesome now you mentioned this a little bit before how you know you've had different members come through the band over the years right so Eric, who's on bass, I think, correct me if I'm wrong, I think he's been with you for around six years, but now he's finally also an official member. So mm -hmm. why now? What took so long? <laughs> why that, now? that was that was him. You know, that was he he came to us and, and he really did want to do something that was more of a passion for him. Um, you know, ultimately, being the hired gun for our band isn't the most lucrative gig, even though it, it was steady, I guess. Sure. But during. You know, during the pandemic, you know, a lot of people change things that what they were thinking and you look at life and you, you, you figure out what's important to you. Like I, I used to hate touring. I, mm. I, I, it took me away from my family and I didn't like how long we had to do it for. I didn't like having roommates. I like keeping to myself for the most part. Mm. Uh, but once you took that away, it made me realize, damn, I love playing shows. And so I think for Eric, it was like, I need to do something that's mine. And I, if whether I'm going to be a producer, whether I'm going to start my own band, or if this band wants me to be part of it, sure. I don't want to just be a hired gun. I don't want to set up stages and shit like that. I want to be an artist. And he came to us and he expressed that. And we talked about it and we realized that we wanted to be a band and we wanted to have our guy. And if he's willing to be committed, then we're going to be committed to him. You know, and and his voice carried weight, and I like it because mm. uh, Craig and I, even though we're like been the longest tenured, we don't have all the answers, mm. creatively or or business wise, and you need other people's help. And you know, he was a great fresh voice, and very 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 creative, and he's so chill, and <laughs> I get riled up and emotional, and he's just like, I just kind of like the riff, man. Like, okay. All right. All right. Well, that's, yeah. Okay. So, sometimes you need cool that, riff. right? When, when you have all these different arguments going around about you, yeah. sometimes you need that guy. It's just a little chill. It's like, oh, that's just a good riff. Like, it doesn't sound like, hey, Jude or Bohemian Raps. He's like, oh, I just kind of like the riff. All right. Yeah, that's, all right uh, that's, that's great. Now, what about Maddie? What does he bring into the table, right? Because he's Maddie, in the band as well. Maddie's interesting because that's not like he sort of came out of nowhere to some degree. He's been around in our circles. We've just never really been uh, in, in touch with him until last year. And we just needed a lead guitar player because um, so, you know, we're playing a uh, Blue Ridge Rock Fest. Right. And I hurt myself on that foot, uh, my foot. I hurt it and I couldn't play the show. So we had a higher drummer and <laughs> we need a lead guitar player because it was still pandemic stuff. So mm -hmm. our uh, Kevin Thrasher, who was doing it before. He's like, I, I'm not going to go out there. Like it's, it was still weird. Right. Yep. Um, and it's all fair, you know, cause everyone had their reasons of, we didn't understand what the fuck the virus was. Right. It's right. just complicated every week. So yep. it, you know, that was his decision. And so we needed somebody and Maddie came in and it was like, you know, Thrasher ended up really going into the producer thing. He ended up working with Travis Barker. And when you're with Travis Barker, you may have, Lil Wayne come through the door, a Kardashian, <laughs> you know, and you might have Machine Gun Kelly. And so it's really hard to not take that opportunity to go and, and grind it out with a band that's, you know, been as very chaotic as us. But you know what? Once we parted ways with him, it became stronger because all of us are band dudes. We're all yeah. dedicated to the band, you know, and it just became easier. So Maddie is now this newer guy where that relationship's still a little like not fully certain of what it is, but creatively is exactly what we need. And mm -hmm. on stage, he might not be as flamboyant as the last guy, 
but he has his own look. He looks right. like a rock star. He looks like this emo Ingve <laughs> Malmstein. It's crazy. <laughs> emo Ingve Malmstein. I've never that's heard those two him. together. I, wow. That's what I call him. I'm like emo Ingve, dude. <laughs> <laughs> that's great. I love it. Do you ever get bothered with that term emo? I know some people embrace it. Other people hate it. I know the hair metal scene. People love it. They hate it. What do you think of that term emo? Uh, I, I've learned to embrace it. Um, the only time I ever push back on it is when it's used to completely define any one thing. And there's not exact, you don't know how to define which bands are emo. You just know it when you <laughs> right. hear it, yeah. you know, and we certainly have that element and I like it. And a lot of the bands that I grew up listening to fall into that, you know, broad category. And it, it to me, it just means like you have those kind of whiny, vulnerable lyrics and you have a sort of fashion <laughs> sense. And <laughs> for us, uh, we uh, embrace it and our vision for the album, which I don't think we fully achieve, but maybe the next one, because we had this vision <laughs> of what we called e emo as an EMO as an emo metal opera. That was the wow. vision. <laughs> yes. <laughs> and so we wanted to have those super vulnerable, dramatic lyrics with the tinge of more metal like a modern like classic metal hybrid versus mm. you know just like standard breakdown thing more metal classic metal riffs you know so album number nine sounds like a plan <laughs> i and that's the thing that if there's any one thing that that i'm not super fired up with this album is that i think we we got halfway through the album was we needed to get something done to keep the band together. And the second half was we have a vision now and now mm -hmm. we're locking in and there's something about a sound. So I'm focused on where we go from here. And I think the next album is the true embodiment of what we want and that vision. So I, that if there's any one downside, it's that I, I think we're just getting started. Well, that's not a downside, in my opinion. Now, before you mentioned playing festivals, and it's one of the things I love about your band is even just recently, right, you played a festival in Belgium where the headline is well, what I'm going to call, quote unquote, classic rock bands, like Guns N' Roses, Def Leppard, Motley Crue. And then I think it was a few weeks later, you're playing a festival in Dallas, and it's, quote unquote, newer bands like Pierce the Veil, The Used, and you fit in on both of those do you approach them differently or with knowing that there's different fan bases? Do you prefer one over the other? Are you like, we're just going to rock for anybody who wants to see us? If you could hear our fights. Because right? <laughs> no one really has the answer on to how to approach them. Um, we do think about certain things where, you know, if there's what you would call a more mainstream crowd, you, we tend to really lean on the hits and dig into the more well-known choruses and things right. like that. Whereas when you have something like the So What Fest, where it's it's kind of those niche fans that really like to yeah. dig into the emo punk metal scene, hardcore, whatever, maybe we can dig a little deeper into, you know, the fucking the stuff with breakdowns <laughs> and and double bass parts and stuff. <laughs> so we're willing to be a little more open in that regard. But other than that, I mean as long as we've played, we have like a good six songs that are like, we have to play those no matter right. what. Mm -hmm. So that's more than half the set on a lot of those types of things. So it's kind of already figured out. And then it's like, okay, well, how do we approach the next part? Is this a crowd that may not really know us that well? So we can play the new shit mm -hmm. or, you know, is this crowd going to be open to new shit? Like it's, it actually does become a challenge because you don't want people to be bored, right. you know? And so, we try to mix it up and we just kind of get a feel for what works. And sometimes like those, uh, uh, the European, uh, to them, rock music is a little different. It's, <laughs> it's like much more embraced and people travel. So they know all the bands and we could kind of play anything and they just love being a part of it. It's, it's in their culture a lot more than in the U S mm. so do you find that these older artists are really maybe even more so the older fans give you guys enough respect to us. I find at least people in my age group, I'm a little bit older than you. They're always like, oh, new music sucks, new music sucks. And I always hate when people do that. And then they're like, rock is dead. I'm like, stop, you know, there's all this music out there. Do you feel like you get that respect from some of those older fans or maybe not enough? Um, I don't really know because like, I, I find like our fans are now aging 
you know, <laughs> they get old also, right? <laughs> yeah. And so I, I do see like the dads and moms bring in their six to like 10 year olds and <laughs> love it, putting them up on the stage to like watch the show. I'm like, damn, there's a whole new generation, you know? And then there's those teenagers, those, those sort of really passionate about music type of fans that find us. And I was one of those. I was the one listening to all the, you know, the misfits or at the time of Avenged Sevenfolds of the world, right? Yep. Uh, that who weren't like playing arenas and that sort of thing, and still listening to Led Zeppelin and Guns N' Roses, right? The, mm -hmm. the stadium acts of their given eras. Um, but there are older fans. I do find some that are much more open minded than I am. Um, oh, wow. You know, I'm an old soul, so I, I typically lend my like what I uh, gravitate towards is things not recorded on computers you know mm -hmm. and i like stuff that's very organic sounding and that's i just feel it more that's for me mm -hmm. and so a lot of modern music I, I kind of tend to not be as interested in typically speaking so i can understand it's not necessarily a nostalgia thing for me as much as it is a tone thing right yeah, sure. and so um then add nostalgia after that um but yeah i think there's there are a lot of open minded people i think there are people who aren't as so close to the the process and the picture that they just hear something and they feel it or they don't hmm. you know and especially live if it's like oh, i've never heard this band you know if they're the energy's right that night and they just kind of gravitate or they feel it like this band's fucking good you know <laughs> absolutely now your tour is starting on august 31st i think in salt lake city you know, some of yeah. your headlining shows so what could the fans expect from these headlining shows uh it's, this is the part that makes me excited and nervous. <laughs> right. uh, excited because, and nervous. Okay. Uh, we are we're pulling out all the stops that we possibly can. You know, um, it's been a wild ride. It's been up and down, and rebuilding and rebuilding and rebuilding and new members and rebuilding for a mm -hmm. long, long time. But there's something been happening over the last couple of years. There's this sort of resurgence for us, and there's this new build. You can look at it in our Spotify numbers. I'm not yep. a numbers guy. I don't like to go online, right? <laughs> but it's there, and our manager sure. shows us, you're growing. It's like, how are we still growing? And there's a new wave of fans. And it's just like, we need to invest. We need to pull out all the stops on the tour. We need to put on a fucking show, whether that means lighting, whether that means you know, uh, just having things more streamlined, like as far as having a big fucking crew that's going to work every angle and make sure everything goes off without a hitch. And we want to invest in a show. We want to give people an experience. So we are doing a lot more production and there's a lot of making our manager nervous. There's a lot of <laughs> guys, do you know how much a fucking confetti cannon costs, dude? <laughs> yeah. It's like the cleanup fee. Like then, you guys want to go exactly. broke just for cleaning up confetti? It's like, yeah. well, does it make the show better? Yeah, well, fuck it. <laughs> <You know? laughs> and so there's things like that where we're, we're really wanting to bring people into the world and have the visual aid, not just our raw selves. We can always fall back on our raw abilities that sure. there's something just, you know, primal about when we perform that's just, I don't know why I move the way I do. I don't know why, that, but it just works, right? There's a chemistry. It's just natural. It's just God-given. But you add to that, that next level, and now, now you got something really special. So that's that's one thing I'm really looking forward to. Hopefully, fucking people show up, because then what the fuck? <laughs> right. Okay. Now, will you be, I know on your recent tour dates, you were doing a couple of songs from the new album. Will you be adding some more from the new album on the shows? We are. We are, okay. and I'm and I'm nervous about it because, well, one of them, which we've been playing, is is the hardest song I've ever played. Which one's <laughs> that? It's called "Low,", Low. Um, mm -hmm. which you know wasn't like a huge success as far as like reception, uh, streaming or whatever. But when we perform it live, we just we we extend things, and that breakdown is the best part of the show. Mm -hmm. And it's a moment. Those things when. Because I have to think about things as a teenager, right? I have to think, what would 14-year-old me be like? <laughs> that was the fucking best thing ever. Because when you're, you know, you're my age now, you're like, I've seen it, right? Right, sure. So it's just a matter of, do I love the music or not? But when you're that kid and you go, what the fuck? That was insane. <laughs> we need, we want moments, moment after moment to just blow people away. Every song, something special happens. 
And so that's where those new songs, it's, it's a chance for us to invest into them. I'm nervous about playing them because one of them is not going to really have been heard much, but we're excited to play it. The other one has been released, but we've never played it. And, you know, it's, it's exciting. That's the kind of shit that gets me off. That's what makes me wake up and continue to do it. When I, when I go on stage and I'm shaking and I forget how to hold a <laughs> drumstick because I've never played this song before or I've never done all this shit before. What can go wrong? That nervousness, that apprehension, that's what you live for. That's when you, cause when you conquer that and you have something good, you go, that was fucking amazing versus Absolutely. sticking to what's safe. You know? Yeah. Yeah. Look, some of the bands that I've loved for decades play it very safe in concert, same set list year after year. And as a fan, quite honestly, it gets boring. I love to see bands take chances, perform the new music, like you're saying, and be a little nervous about it because that's what makes a live show exciting to me. Yeah. And look, we played that song in, in uh, uh, Europe and it went off, dude. The hmm. new songs went off more than some of our more classically well-known songs. Hmm. And it, it's because of the way we delivered it. You have to tell the story. You know, when I think of like, I mean, you have Kiss as an example, right? Yes. You love Kiss. Yes. Why? Not just because you like listening to the music, but because when you go, you're in an experience. It's yes. a fucking world, <laughs> right? And you know, it's like, even if you've heard the song before, like you said, which can get dull, yeah. you it, you know they're going to do the thing and you fucking can't wait for it. Right. And, Absolutely. And, and that's what we're trying to deliver now. And, and we've never gone this big on production before. Uh, I mean, we're not going to bring a Kiss production. Don't get me wrong. <laughs> not many bands do, so no. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, they're it. That that it's them. They're the <laughs> band that does that, right? right. Maybe Molly yes. Crew, yep. but like, so it's you know we're doing our best that we possibly can, and I can't wait to be fucking nervous and shit myself. <laughs> and then once that first thing goes wrong, then you just gotta roll with the punches. That's awesome. Now, I know even just when looking at set lists, like I remember the first song I ever knew from you guys was Not Good Enough for Truth and Cliche, which I believe hasn't been the set list in quite some time. Any chance yeah. you bring back all these like that or is uh, that look, the past? We, we, we talked about that. The, the problem, if, if you're not super, super familiar with us, is, um, you know, that's another singer. And Plus, yep. he's gone on to have his own career <laughs> yeah. and he still plays some of those songs from time to time. So it's a complicated relationship with that music. Uh, we reached out to him and we talked about the idea of playing one of those old songs. And he was, he was totally cool with it. He's like, <laughs> yeah, man. Cause we wanted to have his blessing. We used to play those songs, but you know, it gets complicated because they're sure. all personal. And, um, we reached out, we said, Hey, we're thinking of doing this one thing. Would you be cool with that? And he's like, yeah, dude, it's, it's fine. Do your thing. But you know, ultimately it, it we're not saying completely no, but okay. <laughs> it, it, you know, it's, it's, it's about the new, it's about moving into the next phase. That's fair enough. Now you mentioned your original singer, Ronnie, right? So it's been yeah. you know, one album only, but one of the things I love is that we've talked about this before you have Spencer on this album, like as a guest vocalist, you've had Josh Todd in the past when Buck Cherry is a guest vocalist and others as well. Would you ever consider teaming up with Ronnie just as a guest vocal on a, a one song on an album? Or is that nah? that's in the past. We want no part of that. Look, the reality is we're friends. Okay, yeah. Ron, Ron. That's why I asked because I know you guys are friends now. Right? Yep, and and any chance that he can, he helps not only myself out but my band out, and he's always wanting to see me succeed. He has a place in his heart for me, knowing that it's like you're still doing it, and <laughs> you're you know he sees me as like a little brother figure. So from a personal level, that door is 100% open. Uh, from a creative level, you know, it's, it, I don't know. And we've talked about it. We've mm -hmm. gone back and forth and we've gone so far as to say, well, let's do some co-writes. We've gone as far as to say, like, what if you just, you know, I'll write with you, I'll produce it. And we won't even like say anything. We'll just release mm -hmm. it as just a song. And it's just the thing. And, and if people like it or they don't, and maybe they look at the notes and say, wait, Ronnie Rackie has <laughs> right, a songwriting right, credit. Wait, Ronnie was on part of this mm -hmm. song. You know what I mean? Like, so there's all kinds of ways to go about it. And it's just nothing really has, has uh, come to fruition. It's just a large part to do with, you know, he's got his thing going on and, yeah. and we've got our thing going on. And when we don't got our thing going on, I I'm a dad full time. You know what I mean? So it's just all those things come into play. I'm not going to say never, but 
it's it can happen i'm not saying no i don't know if he'd say no it's it, it's there it's, I'm, I'm maybe album number there. 10 right we already discussed album number nine right? album number maybe. eight so maybe album number 10 you mentioned before streaming right so to me when i interview especially people who have been around for decades they usually talk down on streaming now i look at a band like yourself and a song like hate myself had over a million streams you're getting out to a lot of fans do you think streaming is a good thing or do you think it's hurt the music industry? Um, I look at it a couple different ways, quite frankly. Um, as a consumer, as a listener, as someone who cares about art, uh, I don't, uh, I have a mixed feeling. <laughs> I, I'm talking not from my perspective as a guy releasing it, as a guy sure. consuming it. Okay. I love and I hate it. Reason being is because, you know, when I turned into the old guy going, man, it was so sick when you'd get a CD and you'd have it and you look at the liner notes and you put it in, you have to absorb it all. Amen. Yes. <laughs> yes. You're literally <laughs> invested in it. Right. Mm -hmm. Yes. And so you have to appreciate it more, even if at the end of the day you go, I don't actually like this and you're bummed. You, you have to appreciate it as much as you can. And there's something to having a, a, a rarity to it, to, uh, not being able to attain it whenever you want. And, and you had a more cultural connection to it. And I got friends because we gravitated towards rock music now, because you have access to everything. Like I'll give you an example. If I'm at the record store and I have a mega death CD in one hand, and this is like 2001 and I have, <laughs> and I have a fucking Eminem CD in the other hand, and I'm going, what do I want? Well, I already know I like Megadeth, so I'm going to get the Megadeth. I don't know about rap. Like, I've never right. really listened to rap. And maybe I miss out on a great opportunity, but this is what I got. And then I gravitate towards other people that know that, you sure. know, and versus now you absorb it all. So you don't have this thing that truly expresses you to a perfect degree. But at the same time, now I get to fucking listen to that, which I never would have before. I would have never listened to country. I never would have listened to all this Mexican music that I didn't like growing up that was always around. But now I can appreciate it because I could sit and listen to it. So I go back and forth with it. But as a as an artist who's releasing the music and based on the way I consume things, it's it's really hard to keep it relevant and it's so fast from one hour to the next you heard mm -hmm. it you're done with it you're on to the next thing and you you spent so much of your life getting to the point of being able to have someone hear it that once it's out it's like it's done like that sucks mm -hmm. you know so not to get into the monetary side of things because there's <laughs> That's another whole thing. Yep. That's a whole other thing that I quite frankly don't understand. How much of that money do I deserve? <laughs> How much of that money do I owe them for giving us the platform and bringing people to the shows who wouldn't have bought CDs but are yep. listening cuz you know they only pay a fraction of a cent to listen to us in conjunction with all their other favorite bands? I don't know. There really is no formula to describe how that it's a good thing or a bad thing. It's just, you just kind of have to accept it and, and figure out how to structure it in a, in a good way or capitalize on it. Cause it's not going away. It's just not. No, it's not. But that's why I always, whenever I'm interviewing everybody, I always tell them the people watching and listening, go buy the physical product. And you guys are offering CDs, you're offering vinyl, you're offering, you know, shirts, there's different bundles and packages available on your website. So I tell everybody watching and listening, go check out those bundles. Mm -hmm. Go buy the physical product. It's okay to stream it when you're in your car or if you're out on a run or something like that, but own that physical product. There's nothing like touching that CD or that vinyl, looking at the artwork, reading the credits and all, and getting the whole experience because you guys put your blood, sweat and tears into this. Mm -hmm. And there's nothing like holding that physical product in my opinion. And I'm that way about all art. So like, I, and I've been trying to get that, my daughters to appreciate that. So we've been going to the mm -hmm. movies a lot. Yeah. I was very excited about the Barbenheimer experience. It was like, <laughs> I'm going to go see Oppenheimer. They're going to go see Barbie. Wait, is it, can kids watch this Barbie movie? I don't know. <laughs> but it was like a whole, like, I wanted to be in the theater and to spend the money and be part of a, a, a large group of people all like kind of absorbing this thing together instead of, you know, uh, we'll wait till it comes out on streaming and then we'll just watch it for free mm -hmm. or, well, you know, the, the rate or whatever. Right. And, 
then maybe we're distracted on our phones or something like, no, let's go. And people worked on this and like, let's give it a real chance. Maybe we really like it, like actually be involved in the art. And that, that matters to me. I actually think it's important because I know, especially if you're constantly distracted by your phone, you know, you, you, you just kind of get depressed sometimes and you're always just reading shit. It's like, I'd rather just be in that world and have someone express themselves through the majesty of song or movie <laughs> or whatever, yeah. you know, like that's, yeah. that's what it is for me. Absolutely. One or two more questions. I'll let you, I want to make sure we plug on when you're out on tour, you have the VIP opportunities, right? So you're talking about having that connection. I think it's important that we plug that, that the fans have the opportunity to have these VIP opportunities meet the band, et cetera. So how do people find out about that? I mean, it's just simple. You just go to the site. You just go to the escape to fate.com and we're working on even like more packages. Obviously they might cost more because stuff costs money, but of course, you know, and, and that was a thing where Craig uh, specifically really, really honed in the idea of like giving people a bang for their buck, you know, at the end of the day, yes, you do want to meet the band and you, this is people that are in your lives every day, but you don't see each other. So <laughs> get to shake your hand and take a picture, but we wanted to make sure we give them opportunity to get the signed vinyls or a shirt or signed posters and shit like that. You know, cause like when you look behind you, you walk into that room, you you're like, this is so sick. Like, <laughs> and you hold that guitar where you just sit there and admire it and go, can't believe fucking Paul Stanley <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, that's insane. Like so yeah. you now have a real connection to that person. And, you know, it, it becomes not just this mythical, fantastical thing. It's like now you're, you're really humanized and you become a much closer fan and everything. And those VIPs really like have changed the way we do things. And it's, it's really exciting for us, you know, and I know for me, I'm going to try to give some away on my Twitch channel. So I'm going to plug that it's twitch.tv slash. Hey, Rob, um, <laughs> I'll be doing, I'll, I'll give away a couple of VIPs on there and stuff. Let some fans get, get a chance to meet us if maybe they can't afford it, but yeah. So they just, they just got to go to the site, escape That is awesome. Now in 2023, unless you're Taylor Swift, you don't sell a million albums anymore, right? Nobody does. Right. Although you have a million streams, which is great. How are you going to measure success of your new album? Because you know it's not going to sell a million copies. Bro, this that is that is <laughs> every single day I have that conversation with the band. <laughs> we really don't know how to measure it. Um, there are numbers when you reach, you know, three million listeners or whatever. It's fucking cool when your song hits a million streams. It's fucking awesome. But then there's a song like "Low." It's like okay, maybe that wasn't as successful as the last song or as the mm. one after but when you play it live there's something different about it that connects and there's a, an energy is it how many people show up to the show or how much it means to one person mm. i truly don't have an answer for that there is no perfect algorithm or formula mm. to define what success is um my most successful moment in my career came when i wrote i'm the drummer and i wrote this song which is just acoustic guitar and vocals mm. I'm not on the recording. And it was after my grandfather had passed away and we happened to be playing El Paso, my hometown on the anniversary of my grandfather's death. And we're playing a free show because it's my tribe does free shows. This get people to come to the casino and buy alcohol and gamble. Mm -hmm. And my whole family's there. And, you know, I was surprised, uh, you know, my kids were there and everything. And so I was like, Oh, I wasn't expecting this. And so all that and it leads to a moment where I have thousands of people singing these lyrics I wrote, um, you know, like a few like blocks from where my grandpa's buried. And I'm just mm. all those things just like chemically just like it hits me in a different way. How much money I made that night can't really compare to no. how I made I got goosebumps feel. as you were just explaining that to me. That's right. that to me is success. Right? When we're talking about success, that's success right there. Exactly. But with that said, there's also when your manager calls you and say, Hey, we're going to send you this much money. And you go, <laughs> wow. Okay. It was right. worth it. I have and a family, right? Hey girls, daddy doesn't have to work for the next month. You know, right. we're going to spend time together. Those, all those things, they all, it, it's not a perfect algorithm. You just, as long as I know that I want to keep going, then to me, that's success. You know, whether it's arenas or whether it's a bar, I, it's just, I don't know. I don't know how to measure it, honestly. 
Well, that's awesome. Well, album number eight, Out of the Shadows, is due out on September 1st. We already heard there's going to be an album number nine, maybe even an album 10, right? So your fans have a lot to look forward to. Anything else you want your fans to know about with the record or the upcoming tour? No, nah, I mean, you said it all, dude. Just it, it, like enjoy it. Try to be invested into it and try to understand it and really fully get into what we're trying to do and appreciate what's there and obviously come to the shows and just be part of the world and let it just just sort of take over your your aura for a little while and and maybe we can connect as people you know absolutely well you know Robert, i'll just say you know thank you on behalf of the fans thank you for you know almost 20 years of great music and lots of great memories and there's more to come and i'm sure that i've heard the album ahead of time and i think the fans are going to love it so thank you for everything for sure thank you all right all righty there you have it I'd like to thank Robert for joining me, talking all about the upcoming new Escape the Fate album, Out of the Shadows, as well as the upcoming tour, his thoughts on the music industry, and so much more. I highly recommend all the Escape the Fate fans out there, go pick up that new album coming out on September 1st. If you're watching this on YouTube, hit that subscribe button below. If you're listening to one of my podcasts, subscribe over there as well. Also, Head on over to Facebook and follow my page, The Rock Experience with Mike Brunn, where each and every day we talk about all the rock and roll music that you love. You could also follow me on Instagram and Twitter as well. That's it for this episode. Thanks for watching. Thanks for listening. See you all next time.